Good morning. Just a quick Good audio morning. check. Ron, you're with, yeah, we're, we're uh, our mic's working. Once I unmuted, yeah, it worked fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody that's joining us. Um, just a moment. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, the goal today is I'm going to go through a few overview features of the inventory module, and then Bill's going to do a deeper dive into the cycle count process for those who want to understand how the cycle counts work. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So from an inventory standpoint, from a setup, and this is true, and as everybody knows, most modules in the system, there are control records. There's an inventory control record that defines setups for the inventory module, the cost group you're going to use, and the cost method. Obviously, the cost method controls whether you're going to use standard cost or average cost or actual by lot. Those are the three options we, we, we let you choose. And then some account numbers that default. And then the, the reason I'm bringing this screen up is this is where we keep the average usage calculations uh, for the inventory inquiry screen and other reports. The total months of usage are stored. We're keeping, I'm keeping 36 months here. Some people will keep 60. Uh, and then here is where you put in what your average cost is going to, or average usage is going to be calculated on. So it's going to be the last six months of usage. Uh, some people will use six. Some people will use 12. Most people don't go beyond 12 because once you get beyond 12 months of usage, it, it gets skewed by history or activity. Uh, so we're trying to keep it recent activity to calculate your average usage. And then lastly, from a days of transaction history, in the imb.q screen, how many days of transaction history do you want to see on the screen? This isn't how many days you want to keep in the IT file. The IT file will keep as many years of history as you want to keep. But how many do you want to see in the imb.q? If you're trying to keep that short and sweet, you might make this one to two years. If you want to make it longer, that's fine, but this is adjustable as you're bringing up IMB.Q. It'll come to the screen and make this decision. Uh, we'll go through the bottom part of the screen. We'll, we'll have a separate session later for physical inventory, and Bill's going to cover the cycle count process here in, in just a couple of minutes. So Before for the image, yeah, yeah, go ahead, oh, Bill. I was going to say, uh, Ron, just if you want to, if you don't mind, open us back up into the control screen. Just wanted to. Uh, Add some commentary there that the number of you mentioned the average month's usage, um, you know, that that can be a very important decision, I would say, because, you know, if you're setting your safety stocks based on monthly usage, um, you know, the the period that you choose there is really going to determine how responsive those safety stock numbers are. So let's say you, you know, your, your demand just suddenly drops or it suddenly increases. Then you you might want um, you know to to go to a shorter period there to make those safety stocks more responsive, and alternatively, if you are in a you know kind of seasonal, regularly seasonable or seasonal cycle, you might want to you know kind of hang tight, <clears throat> use a longer period so that you don't get uh, you know you just kind of don't don't go with the too much with the flow when when those times happen. So just a, a good point there on average month. So uh, go ahead, Ron. Just No, thank you. And just to point yeah. all the way back to the, the planning quantities in part study, that's what Bill's referring to. I think we're all aware of things like safety stock. You can put a number like 100 in the safety stock field, or you can also put in a factor of U of usage. So if you put in U 2.5, that lets you st that lets your uh, safety stock float as two and a half months average usage. So that's that's where the average usage comes into play in, that, in those cases. Just, just to take that full circle. Um, the other setup in the inventory module is the inventory locations. You can have as many inventory locations as you want, and you can call them whatever you want. And you can list the locations. I can see everything I want to see. And if I say look at the at the stockroom location, then it will bring it up the description. It'll bring up the cost group it belongs to. It'll bring up the type code. SK is the type code for anything that is a stocking location. Any other type code is a non-physical location where dollars are moving, but not quantities. So if you want to be able to look at IMV.Q and see a quantity on hand in inventory, it's an SK type location. Anything else, adjustments or work in process or line stock locations, you use to move in and out of those locations, but it's not moving quantities, it's moving dollars only. 
and then obviously physical and negatives. And, and the, most of these are a one-time setup, but if you open a new warehouse or you open a new location in your inventory, you can always set up a new inventory location here, assign it to an inventory uh, account number, put it in as a plan group, and then check this box down here on the bottom if you want MRP and MinMax to see this as a valid inventory location when it does its planning. So if, if this is unchecked, then MRP ignores this location. And if it's checked and MRP sees this as valid inventory, and again, just to state the obvious, if this was say a customer return location where you hadn't inspected it yet, you don't know if it's good, you don't want your planning module to see it as valid inventory. So you would uncheck this box. That's the purpose of that. So you can set up as many locations as you want. Again, you can call them whatever you want uh, and they'll, they'll be, these are general locations. We're not talking about bins. Bins is a separate function. And I should mention, let me uh, let me go back here. This bin control checkbox here says, I am actually gonna control this location by bin. So every time I put inventory away in this location, I'm gonna tell it which bin it's going into. And every time I pull it out of this location, I tell it which bin I'm pulling it out of. So it, it adds an extra layer of data entry or scanning to everything you do. Uh, but it does give you right down to the bin when you're looking for that part. Uh, it'll tell you exactly where to find it. Short of that, if you're using a reference bin, it'll tell you where the product should be, but not necessarily where it is, just where you have said it should be from a reference bin standpoint. Okay, just a okay. quick note um, uh, for those of us not monitoring the chat, just as a good point, anybody who has a question, just feel free to chat it as well as uh, jump in here. Um, and, and then Ron or I will try to address it and, and keep an eye on the chat if the other one's presenting, okay? All right. Okay. Um, then just, I think, IT ID is the most commonly used inventory transaction screen. Adjusting inventory, you, you adjust with this area. You, could, you can look up parts by part number, description, et cetera. And then you can say where you're moving, uh, I'm sorry, how many you're gonna move, uh, where you're moving it from uh, and where you're moving it to. I'm going to move back to receiving inspection. And this will make an inventory transaction for finished good to RI. When you save this, it posts it and it moves it all in one step and it hits the general ledger in the inventory register file. So the, the account number associated with the finished good account number gets credited and the account number associated with the receiving inspection location gets debited. So this is a one at a time move. You can, you can continue to do this as many times as you want to adjust inventory. Uh, the multiple inventory location, uh, inventory transactions procedure is IT.E2. I'm gonna skip that for just a second and go back to INV rec. There is an inventory requisition process that I'm not sure a lot of people use, and I did wanna just mention this. If you wanna put in inventory requisition, which means I'm going to move inventory from one warehouse to another, uh, and I wanna, I wanna document it, then this is the way to do that. You can create an inventory requisition, who, who requested it, what date they requested it, and what's the current status, uh, notes about this, and all of the parts you want to transfer from location A to location B. And you can put all these in. This does not actually, the inventory requisition screen is just that. It's a requisition and it can print a, it can print a form that you can send along as a packing list if you like. This does not actually move the product. This just sets up the re requisition as a, as a uh, record so that when we get to the IT.D2, we can refer to this requisition, it'll load all these parts up and we can move them all. So if I've got a requisition, I can go to IT.D2 and I can say, what type is this? Is it a requisition? Is it an M ship? Is it a receipt or shorts? And the way this works is the two most popular are inventory requisitions and receipts. If I, let's say, move a, receive a whole set of products into receiving inspection, and then I need to move them all to the stock room later. This allows me to load all the parts on that receipt onto the screen without having to type all the part numbers back in. So it's a, it's a nice, nice shortcut way to do things. So if I say which inventory requisition, I can do this and it loads up all the parts on that requisition. And then all I have to do is hit save and it moves all those parts. It makes inventory transactions for all of those parts and it's done. So that's a nice shortcut way to make 
mass inventory moves from one warehouse to another, transferring in in intercompany or uh, or different locations. If you've got, let's say, different cities or different warehouses from a distribution standpoint, um, the the that's kind of the entry screens I wanted to cover. Now the the two other most uh, popular reports and inquiries. The IMB.Q obviously is the most popular part uh, inquiry. Again, I can look up a part here. I can see a, a current status of all my parts, and you can see those 10 I moved to San Jose are here. You can see that it actually did move them. And on the screen, I'm seeing total on hand, what's my committed to my sales orders and potentially a work order if I'm a back flush situation allocated, which would be other work orders, shortages, net available, and on order or incoming from either purchase orders or work orders. Uh, my commitments, if I want to see those 43 commitments, I can see them here. And the, or the date on the left-hand side is the date they're scheduled to be delivered uh, to the customer. If I want to see on order, it's incoming. Because this is a make part, it shows me all the work orders that are scheduled to be received for this. The usage history, again, this is showing me 36 months worth of history. And I can see 12 months or six months or however many months I want to see here just as a reference in case I want to you know, play the graphic game. And lastly, the transactions tab shows me all the transactions that have been made for this, this part uh, by descending transaction ID, which is generally by date. And you can see this is the 10 I just did for that uh, that inventory requisition. If I right click anywhere on here and look at transaction details, I can see all the all the transactions and I can see which inventory requisition it came from. So inventory inquiry again is the inquiry against a single uh, a single part number. Uh, just to refer back to the bins, if I'm a reference bin, I see just the bin number and no quantities. If it's a bin control, I will see the bin and the quantity with any allocations involved for that quantity. Um, last thing for me to cover, um, the INV.R1, there are a ton of inventory reports. The INV.R1 is probably the most popular uh, from a costed inventory standpoint. So if I want to see uh, a report that goes out and it's I want to see all of the uh, parts with available quantity not equal to zero. In other words, I don't care if the, if the on hand is zero uh, or include all parts, et cetera. You got different options here. Do I want to extend negative balances? Do I want to look at only a certain category or only a certain inventory location? Or if I just look at everything that's on hand in inventory, I can run this process, goes off, gives me 29 pages. And like this one part we just did, we can see I've got 29 parts at $59 for $1,593.38. So this report here sorts by category. So all the blank categories go first, then the then by category numeric and alpha, obviously. So this is this is the report you would run if you want to balance to the general ledger's inventory figures. That may be your entire inventory, or you might have to go by location. You might have to say, hey, I want to know um, what my stockroom inventory is because that has a different location than everything else. So if I want to compare to the general ledger, I want to look at only the stockroom inventory. And obviously then that report would give me a little different look and feel. Hey Ron, do you mind uh, just, just showing them real quick how to create jobs? I don't know if everyone's familiar, but it might be worth just showing that, you know, often you're going to be running inventory reports and you want to know like a specific location or you want to, you know, a group of parts and you want to just kind of flip to that really quick and run it or put it on a schedule so you get the report automatically. So if we just show them that real quick, I think. Sure. This is the case where most of the times when we did training, we told you all don't put anything in the job ID. This is the case where we're going to put something in the job ID. So if I wanted to create a job ID, R1.stock, I can give it a unique name. And I can give it the configuration options down here that I want to choose. In other words, I want to go to PDF. I want to go to part option one. I want to look at my stock room inventory only. And if I save this, I'll just save it for now. And so that next time I bring it up, I can right click in this option 
and I can see inv.r1.stock. I can pick that and I can run that process and I can say run it and then it runs the process for me and I don't have to configure all the options again every time I want to do it. Additionally, later on when we talk about the ACE background utilities, the service dot control where we set it up a nightly process, this job ID that you gave it being unique will let you put this job ID in the in the job list for the nightly process. It'll pick up all the options down here every time. Yeah, so perfect. It, I think it's a great way to to kind of streamline and and uh, make the inventory management functions and the companies more efficient, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, there's a whole ton of reports you can feel free to get used to. I don't know if everybody's gotten through all these. There are inventory transaction listings, historical reference information. So um, feel free to you know, run any of these. There is an inventory requisition form. Uh, if I wanted to see this as a, as a PDF doc, let's see what this looks like. And I said requisition three. Then if I print this, I could send it along with the parts. Uh, that's a bad example. Uh, set along with the parts. This would show lines if it was working right, uh, and give me a list of all the parts. And this becomes somewhat of a, of a, you know, internal packing list if you want to send the product along. Sit along with the product when you send it out. Okay, uh, that's kind of just a quick overview of the setup and the day-to-day -day operations and the inventory. Um, and Bill, I don't know if you want to take over and process the, the cycle yeah. count before we go on. Yeah, so I'll yeah, stop before, sharing my screen. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, be before we do, just real quick, if anybody in the group has any, like, you know, ma major issues in the inventory module they want to just bring up right now, we got, you know, half of Rover founding here <laughs> with <laughs> us, so it might be a good time. Uh, just take advantage of it. This is, uh, you know, this is not, you know, this is open, so... Um, just give everybody a second to do that, and at any time you can, you, we can flip back to Ron, and any any inventory question too, if we uh, if we need to. All right, all right. I'm I'll I'll take it over, Ron. Then, and we're gonna start talking about um, uh, the cycle counting uh, functions in uh, Rover ERP. Um, so you know, just really quick, um, you know, if, if anybody's not familiar or hasn't implemented a cycle counting program um, it is the idea basically is that you know you can institute um, regular counts of your inventory um, on a pretty you know pretty much whatever schedule you you want to um, in order to ensure that the the accuracy of your inventory is uh, where it needs to be so you know what determines that it's often you know kind of how what the level of customer service you're you're after. So if you, you know, if you need to be on the phone with a customer and you need to be, you know, 99.5% accurate with, you know, whether an items in stock available for that customer, then you need to have inventory accuracy at 99.5% um, to do that reliably. So um, cycle counting is a great way to to basically you know, dial in your inventory accuracy on all your parts or a group of parts or high value parts. Um, so that's why we, we we're going to talk about it today. And and again, any questions uh, throughout, please <clears throat> feel free to put them in the chat. And Ron, if you don't mind monitoring the chat, because I'll, you know, um, just just to jump in mm -hmm. if, if something comes in in the chat, okay? Sure. All right. So I've got here uh, Rover ERP open, and uh, we're going to talk initially about um you know the the first steps and kind of a really quick walkthrough of, of how to implement a cycle count program in in rover erp um, so the first screen actually um also if anybody's not familiar with we have the the favorites tab here which uh which you can basically kind of save commands that you're using so i did this for for convenience here so we're going to start with um parts p1 so uh, this is uh, called stratified parts for cycle counting. So here you have um, basically uh, a methodology that's going to kind of stratify your parts from uh, into A category B and C. Um, so you can use a dollar cutoff criteria, 
You can use a percentage uh, usage cutoff criteria as well. Um, you can define it by cost group, and you can also choose which part statuses to include. So here, let's say we're going to um, start a job. So we're going to go with new. Okay. And let's say we're going to use the dollar cutoff criteria. So let's say we're going to use uh, part cost. Uh, pretty cool feature here is uh, you can also use part cost times the average usage. So that's really kind of a way, again, going back to our usage uh, conversation and inventory control. Now you can kind of determine your ABCs based on recent usage and, and you're, so you're hitting those uh, those parts that have been used more, that you've been buying more, more frequently uh, in terms of your counts. Um, later, we're going to use this stratification of A, Bs, and Cs to determine how frequently we want to we want to count a part. So, here we're going to choose that option. And um, you know, right now I'm just going to pick some arbitrary dollar amounts. This is a demo account, um, and I'm going to choose anything that's approved change in process or preliminary okay so we're gonna you know we're gonna basically same same concept here you can put this on a job and it's going to tell us kind of what the the breakdown um of parts are um so yours is going to look a lot different that the dollar code cutoffs is going to be a lot different than than what we have in the demo account uh but this is how you can kind of tell how many a b's and c's are so let's say you know i don't want to count the lower value items I don't want that many parts to be to be C's. What you might choose to do is just change this cutoff, you know, drop it a little bit, adjust it, and then we're going to run the job again. And you know, we'll we'll see some some adjustment to that. Um, not much there though. Let's let's try one more uh, stratification. Okay, and you can kind of see how these numbers change. So that's uh, that's basically the the main way to um, to determine your A, Bs, and Cs. You can, again, uh, this is going to be based on um, the usage. You can always go into field help to check. Um, alternatively, if you don't want to do it in in batch this way, um, you can use uh, parts.e. So we'll go we'll go into where that ABC code is in parts.e. Just pick a um, general number here. Okay. All right, and then the uh, ABC code is going to be over in the material control tab, and you'll just see it kind of right here where, where it um, tells you what the ABC code is. So you can actually, you know, manually update this on a part, um, and then um, alternatively, you can use a uh, part change.e for a mass part change. So. If anybody's not familiar, this is a screen that most, a lot of um, our customers are, are that are heavy users uh, will use this to to maintain uh, data for like an, uh, a large batch of parts. You can, you know, specify a file path here in the base, or you can add a customization and just, you know, browse and use an Excel file or something to upload what part numbers you want to change. And then here you would just go to the material control change tab and then, um, Enter the ABC code, and then that that field will be updated on on all parts that were uh, selected. So, if we jump further, anybody have any questions on this? Ron, did I, did I do it justice so far? Yep, everything looks good so far. All right. Okay, uh, we're going to go back into that um, that inventory control screen that Ron uh, showed us earlier. And here we're going to focus uh, specifically on the the cycle counting um, section here. Um, so you can define a unique adjustment location for your cycle counts or cycle counts, uh, which becomes very helpful for you know dif distributors and manufacturers to sort of track uh, inventory losses um, that are that are just due to to variance. Um, you can define um, frequency here. By your ABC stratification, you can make those um, count frequencies unique to individual inventory locations. So you might have one location, let's say finished goods or stock, that that you want to count, you know, more frequently because it's 
it's more important to your customer service and you have another location that's lower value screws or something like that you might you might want to have different um different frequencies there as well as within those locations you can exclude certain categories uh from those okay and then here you just have something to indicate if if a cycle count is in process so that um uh, we we don't want to be making changes or uh while while that's happening so um, this is basically a, a core. This is how you kind of set up the uh, the nuts you know, or set up the parameters for uh, for the frequency of the cycle counts. Okay. Um, after that, we're going to go into uh, IMV.p1, which is going to be uh, assignment of cycle dates. So here, um, let's do. Okay, we're gonna just uh, make a job here and then we're gonna enter day for today. Uh, let's say inventory only, plan group one, and we are going to assign um, cycle dates based on that stratification um, that we just did of ABCs. So I see it's, it ran through uh, 689 parts. Um, and now we have, we have uh, basically put on every part um, what, date that part is going to be scheduled for cycle counting okay so now we're going to uh, go over if we want to take a look uh, a useful report uh, here we have imv.r3 if we want to um, see what that's what that schedule looks like um, so here i have a job saved here and it, it's going to be on the stock location okay and then this is in the um, just the kind of preview view and this kind of, you can see, you know, on, on each day, how many A parts are going to be counted, how many B parts, C parts, um, you know, for that particular location. Um, the reason for that is that this, again, that's going to be an iterative process. You might run that and say, I'm counting 150 parts a day and that's too many. So you, you can either change your ABC stratification or you can change your days in the imb.control and then rerun that until you get it to a comfortable number of parts absolutely yeah it's a it's a really good point to to sort of maintain that that you're you're using that to uh to give you feedback on how how you set up the parameters in imb.control um or parts that um e1 and then and then kind of dialing it into where you want because you might have depending on the number of resources you have allocated to do cycle counting, it, it could vary how many counts you want to be doing per day, right? So great, great point, Ron. Um, okay. One, one, uh, one quick note, I'm sorry, Corey was just no, letting no. me know that all the attendees are muted and don't have the ability to enable their microphone. When, when we're done with the presentation, Corey will figure a way to open that up so we can all, uh, so people can use their microphone. For now, if you have to, if you're trying to get us, go ahead and send us a chat. Sorry. Nope. No, that's a very, uh, very important. Uh, in case anybody's point. talking and, and want to know why we're not listening. <laughs> yeah. It's a good uh, PSA, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we've got our parameters set up. We've got the distribution accounts looking the way we want it. Now we're going to go into cycle P1, and we are going to just create the um, cycle count records. Um, so here I just have a, do a job set up. Um, you know, similar, we're going to just basically run it, um, you know, choose our locations that we want to run this, can uh, optionally exclude parts with no on hand, bin numbers can be specified here. Um, and then basically this is uh, telling us, okay, we, we made five cycle records, um, you know, for, for today, uh, based on this, okay. Uh, so Next, we have um, cycle.r1, <clears throat> which is basically going to tell us what is our what are our cycle counts to do today. Um, so here we have uh, stock location as well. So here's an important one um, as well. You know, you can check in at any point on the cycle date of what you know. Did anything get counted? Is it, are they all in status new? Are they counted? Are they voided? Um, but essentially, this is going to tell us, uh, you know, basically what our um, what our cycle tags are, what parts supposed to be counted, and this should be used and can be used. Uh, you run it to Excel 
And we'll do that here uh, as a count sheet as well, if you like. Um, best practice maybe to uh, delete, it depends on, on uh, personnel, but if you wanna kind of really create a blind cycle count, um, then you then you can basically, uh, you know, well, actually this, this, this one's perfect for it actually, because it doesn't list the, uh, the current inventory in that location. So this Bill, is really- a, There's an option when you run the report to show the quantity or not. You're talking about blind. Oh, uh, there it is. That, there you go. That yep. print quantity. If you check that, it'll show the on-hand quantity, but most people don't want the people to know what they're counting. There you go. Um, so it could be used, Ron, to that point. Uh, you know, it, basically it's flexible in either way. It could be used as a count sheet that's blind, or it could be used as a, a count sheet with what the quantity in the system is. Um, so this is really a good way for somebody to print this out. It's got spacing set up so that it's kind of meant to, you know, you put on a clipboard or something and go out and, and do your counts, uh, record them. Uh, and then you're going to, you know, come into the system uh, later and enter them. So uh, I'm going to jump over right to that screen, which is um, cycle.e. And this is where you um, are going to enter your count information. So we're going to pick a, a tag and we're going to specify, you know, quantity counted date and we can initial it. Uh, for later traceability of of who uh, entered the count, okay, and that's just uh, that that's something you can multiple you can do, you know, all your tags in one screen. You can do it tag by tag if if uh, they're they're done at different um, times. Now, Ron, important point is that the basically when we post this, it's going to post um, when when is it? Is it the start of the day or is it the end of the day for the for that inventory location? It can be any time during the day. Generally, once you, you do your cycle count in the morning, then you enter your cycle counts addition, also in the morning, run your comparison report and everything looks fine. You can post it at any time, generally in the morning to get it out of the way. Okay. The adjustment okay. to inventory oh. is going to be the difference between the quantity you counted and the quantity you started with when you printed the tag, printed the uh, ran cycle.p1, created the Perfect. tag. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, um, so the next uh, the next screen we have is cycle R three, and this is going to be um, tags have been you know created, tags have been entered now, and we want to take a look and see uh, what the you know what the variance looks like. So this is a and great. Go ahead. Yeah. Just as a note, there was a couple questions about what happens in, in how do I correct errors that I find. We don't know we have any errors until we get to this point. Right now, we're just putting in, we put in counts, and now we're say, seeing the difference between what was counted and what was the beginning inventory. This is where you'll see your errors and where you start making adjustments, so. All right, uh, so just jumping back here, uh, Cycle R3 is a great report to, you know, validate counts that have been entered by somebody else, and then they can um, trigger or you know, uh, in your process, you can build a process that that uses this information to recount. Uh, so you might want to run this report even to Excel. You know, you can uh, just kind of identify the ones that need to be recounted, delete the other ones, add a column, delete the you know the prior count quantity, and and just use that as a recount sheet as well. Um, it's also a really great report, and probably the original intent is to to take a look at it before posting. So. Um, that is a good segue to our, uh, you know, when we're going to post. So again, up until this point in Rover, there hasn't been any financial impact. And by the way, just again, to follow up on how do we correct these things? If you find errors or variances in the cycle R3 report, you go back to cycle.e and update the tags that need to be corrected then rerun cycle.r3 and you just keep doing those two processes until you get the numbers where they should be. Absolutely. So let's say we ran cycle r3 and earlier we entered the the uh, quantity for uh, cycle tag one. We would just go back into cycle.e since it hasn't posted yet, we can still edit it and we could update the quantity if we recounted it, okay? Yeah, and, and by the way, the, the intent in this screen is to sort by, it's gonna enter by tag number. So if you put in your starting tag number that you're going to enter for, the next tag number will come up on each line and you don't have to enter the part number or anything. All you do is enter the quantity on each on each field. Excellent. And, and even the date and the initials will stay from the previous one until you change it. 
Okay. Um, so now let's say we're we're feeling confident. We've got our variance report. Uh, we're ready to post. Uh, Cycle.p2 is for uh, posting the tags to inventory. Um, so here we would, you know, just enter the cycle date, um, register date, and plan group again, and we can run this process. And this is going to alert us that we have, you know, 15 uncounted cycle tags on this date. Um, Basically, so you can't I, post a cycle count until so, all tags are accounted for. Yep. So we need to. This is where we could we could go back and um, basically we're gonna clear out um, cycle tags that maybe haven't been counted, or we're gonna make sure that they get entered properly, right? That they that they're counted right. since they're scheduled to be counted. So, um, so following uh, the posting process, uh, we have uh, cycle dot uh, r four. And that posting and, process, by the way, is doing nothing more than creating inventory transactions into or out of inventory using that CC adjustment location as the offset. Okay. And then this is, uh, you know, again, we wanted to, we want to see what, um, you know, what cycle tags are out there that haven't been posted yet. Uh, we can see we've got one, you know, one here counted, but we've got, um, you know, 15 that are, that are still pending. So. Um, in this case, um, you know, again, the, the, we would go back, we would enter the counts and then, and then run the process to, uh, to post. So it's just a way to, um, after the, you know, maintain and then, and then go back to the previous, uh, process. And when that, once that's completed, everything's ready, then you run the posting again. And then this report cycle out R4 would come up, you know, uh, with, with just showing you every tag and, and the status of whether it was counted or not. Okay, a couple of chats we got from Sammy. Thanks. Follow up question Is Cycle Daddy only to show variance in the count versus system, or does it do any posting to the GL inventory balance? Cycle Daddy only updates the count in the cycle record. The cycle posting process after the variance reports is where it updates the GL inventory balance. And that was Cycle. Oh, he whatever it was. Sorry. Cycle P2. No, yeah, no, and, yeah, and it's got the register date in there, and that's the date the inventory registers will hit. The IT record will hit based on the cycle count date. The register date is the GL, is the GL date. And the second question was, how do we account for sales activity while we do the counts? You can go ahead and continue to process inventory on anything being cycle counted. When the cycle tag was created, it locked in the beginning count. And then... Uh, It'll, it'll the variance you're going to put in is your your count versus the starting count. Now, where the the where the issue comes in is if if you got a high moving part that you're cycle counting, you need to put a note or a sticker or some kind of a label on that part to say I am cycle counting these so people won't grab them during the sales cycle. If they pull them out, you need to know about it and you need to adjust that in your count. Hopefully you're counting these before you get they get moved for sales, and that's why you do all this in the morning before people get started. Yeah, I, I'll just add Ron to that uh, for Peter too. Like it's it's it it's best practiced also if you can to you know sometimes you'll you'll pick a location or you know uh, and that's why we have the location set up there, um, and you can kind of freeze activity in that location for the period of time that it's being counted. Um, so that that's like physically, you know, just just restricted as another option. But but as Ron mentioned, you can uh, really as long as you run that report before your operations start um, selling and polling, then you're fine because you can you know you can always uh, uh, you just have to basically back it out, you know, adjust your your count to that to to that reflect that. All right. Um, so we we left off on uh, cycle. Actually, real quick, uh, you know, Peter, Sammy, let us know, please follow up if uh, if we didn't, you know, do a good job answering the difference there too. Uh, happy to happy to go deeper. Um, okay, uh, just a couple more screens that are pretty useful and fundamental uh, to the um, to the process uh, cleaning up. So if you let's say you just couldn't do a count, uh, you know, you have the option here to with cycle that P3 to cancel account entirely for the day. Uh, here we just enter the cycle date. 
uh, location. You could you could specify a location here and just uh, cancel the count for those items. And then cycle.p5 is a useful um, tool as well to um, to delete just a range of uh, of tags. So in this case, you know, let's say you know tag one to eight didn't get counted. We can just enter starting tag one starting to any tag eight on that cycle date and then we're going to delete those those tags so um that's cycle p5 and uh i think that that pretty much um you know covers it for cycle counting and just to, to echo in the chat uh corey you know appreciate the questions and and if anybody has any uh, you know any other uh questions or, or is experiencing any challenges with inventory or cycle counting please uh you know, feel free before we before we close here. Ron, do you have anything else to add? No, I think it's a pretty good overview. Uh, again, the the cycle count process with, for the setup with the ABC stratification and the assignment of dates is not a is not necessarily get it right the first time kind of a shot. You know, you're going to run that multiple times until you get the numbers where you want them to be, and and then cycle count will will roll forward. At, as, as you do them, as you post cycle dates, counts, excuse me, and as you cancel cycle counts, it'll roll those to the next available count date. So it just rolls them automatically. You don't have to restratify or reassign the dates. Some people still reassign them maybe on an annual basis. They start over, but it's up to you. Great point. And Sammy, uh, Ron has a follow up here. Cycle.p2. Would that post and cycle P3 would reverse the postings? A P2 if the journal was incorrect. No, once you do cycle.p2, you've posted them and cycle P3 won't do anything. Cycle P3 is something you have to do if you've got a whole bunch of unposted tags that you just don't want to count, you can delete them before you post them. Once you post a cycle count, and it will again, it won't let you post it until everything's been counted or voided. Once you until you do that you can't run cycle.p2. So cycle.p3 actually came along after cycle.p2, but it is a precursor to p2 because it you would run it before you post. Yeah, and, and just kind of a, if that happens, Ron, let's say we do a count and we follow the process, we had somebody checking it, but we still have a, a bad count and it was uh, it's found later that, you know, we forget, we missed a box or something. Um, will we just use journal entry in that case or another do another inventory transaction to to correct that or is there another yeah. mechanism okay i would i would do a manual inventory transaction probably not a journal entry because at that point your gl is not going to match your inventory there you go so, so i would do an it.e or it.e2 if there's more than one uh, and just make the adjustment of the quantities okay and thanks for the thanks for the follow up sammy Okay. Um, if we don't have anything else, Corey, if I think we, yeah. yeah, we've got one other thing. I, I wanted to uh, look at bringing on Mohit. So again, the next Rover Masterclass. This is something that we're 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 dedicated to, and that I think everybody that gets the ability to, to kind of talk to the Rons, the Bills, the Verns, the Cathys, the Jessies, they they appreciate that interaction and that time. And what we wanted to do is create a monthly meetup where we can open it up to the Rover users to have that ability to, to cover a topic with one of the subject matter experts and open it up to questions. Um, so we will be doing these during each month uh, towards the middle of the month and just uh, fluctuating on holidays and covering a topic that's brought up. Uh, we've got the first couple that are seated by us, um, but then just driving it based upon what you, our customers want. And so I think Mohit, uh, if we can get you off mute, I just wanted you to kind of give a precursor of what people can expect to be discussed next month. Are you able to unmute or do I need to? I just allowed. To... Okay, perfect. Thank you, Corey. Thank you everyone for joining uh, for this month. As Corey uh, mentioned in the chat, our next master class is going to be Wednesday, August 14th at 10 a.m. And it's going to be Andrew and myself presenting on change history and the importance and functionality of it uh, in Rover ERP. Change history can be very important because uh, throughout the different modules, 
such as in accounting, sales, uh, service, RMAs, etc. It provides tracking within the ERP to see when changes were made, and you can get information such as timestamps, the user ID, what the change was, and users can also add notes. So this helps with um, just information so that the next person that's looking at a record knows exactly what was done, why it was done, and it's just a, a nice way to communicate within the ERP itself. I, I should also, I'd also like to mention, Mohit, that for those customers who've been around a while and used the older change history, there is a newer version of the change history that's more genericized and, and more, a more general approach and a different location to find it. So it is worth fitting in on this class because there's, there's change history has been enhanced quite a bit. So we... All right, thank you. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, thank everyone. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Thank you.